Why would people bother to analyze combat so deeply? This is a question that very casual players have asked at least once. Here, I want to explain why theory crafting is important. Hello, 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 Count Sake here, back with another Genshin Impact video. Today, I want to talk about theory crafting and why people like to do it. I want to convey a very important idea to both casual and hardcore players in this video, so be sure to stick until the end. Anyway, the obvious simple answer is because these people find theory crafting fun, but of course, if that's all I had to say, then there wouldn't be a video in the first place because that's too obvious. So here's my idea of what's happening, and I hope to present these in a very interesting way. Now, to accomplish this, I want to build elemental gauge theory from the ground up from an empirical science point of view. While I'm not a theory crafter or an expert on how elemental gauge theory works, the intricacies of it don't matter for this video. So if I do get some things wrong about the theory, do keep in mind that the details of the theory aren't what matters, it's about how it could be developed. With that said, let's get started. Curiosity. This is a term which describes an eagerness to know or discover. This one trait is probably responsible for the discovery of countless phenomena. For me, I'm fascinated with physics. It is this basic desire to pursue knowledge that causes theory crafters to do their deep analysis and speculations. You may not realize it, but you're constantly observing things, taking in information and processing it in your brain. An observation is anything taken from the senses. In science, facts are built on observations. If we confirm the same observation many times, we call it a scientific fact, or just fact for short. I think we would like to believe that what we observe is undeniable, but do know that sometimes scientific facts can be wrong or false. Our observations can also be wrong at times as we're prone to making mistakes, so we do have to be careful. After observing the world for a while, you might start to notice patterns. Empirical science is dedicated to making sense of these patterns. So, let's make some observations in Genshin Impact. Bennett's elemental skill lights grass and fire, while Deluxe can't. Kaya's frozen bridge lasts longer than Rosaria's. Applying Pyro, then Cryo, does less damage than doing Cryo, followed by Pyro. Lastly, applying Hydro, Pyro, Cryo, Electro, or Dendro to a target has that element linger on it for a certain duration. So, it's cool and all that we have all these observations, but remember how I mentioned that we have to confirm the observations in order for them to be facts? That begs the question, how sure are we that these observations are true? How do we know that what we observed isn't just a coincidence? With all the noticeable patterns, we would like to be able to understand them, but in order to actually do that, we need to test our observations as mentioned. Let's take Kaya and Rosaria's ice bridge duration for example. Earlier, we stated that Kaya's bridge lasted longer than Rosaria's. This is a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a statement to be proven as either true or false. Let's break down this definition. First, either true or false. This means that the statement cannot be subjective. Other than that, it's pretty self-explanatory. For example, character X is a bad DPS because their DPS is weaker than half of all characters. This statement is ultimately subjective and therefore cannot be a hypothesis. While the reasoning might make sense, it's still not objective. This is because the person uses the word bad. Bad is with respect to the person's own terms and feelings. Many people might not agree that this is bad. Anyway, to fix this, just remove the term bad. Character X is weaker than half of all characters because their DPS is less than half of all characters. Second is to be proven. This means that you need to do some sort of test or present proof to determine whether it's true or false. Let's look back at the ice bridge example. We can conduct a simple test to see whether or not this is true. We can have a simple stopwatch and measure how long it takes from pressing the E skill for the bridge to melt. The stopwatch will end once all the ice is gone. Sure enough, Kaya's ice bridge was shown to last longer. 
if we repeat this test over and over, we can be fairly confident that this observation is true and therefore become a fact. A hypothesis is rather general. It can be an explanation, prediction, a questioned observation, relationship, or even an educated guess. The point is, it can be tested and needs proof. Often, hypotheses can be used to make new discoveries, verify ideas, or expand various models. Right now, we only have a jumble of different facts, so there isn't anything we can say for certain. Let's define some terms to make things simple for ourselves. If we apply an element and it stays on the target for some time, we'll call that an aura. The element that triggers an elemental reaction will be called, well, the trigger. You could say the trigger is practically the second element you apply to the same target. Time to bring out Kaya and Rosaria again. Lonely? Me? Not with someone here nagging me all the time, that's for sure. We know that aura durations vary depending on the attacks being used. We also know that Kaya and Rosaria's ice bridges linger for a certain duration. This raises some questions. Is Rosaria's elemental skill aura duration shorter than Kaya's? Sure enough, we can conduct experiments to see that, yeah, Rosaria's aura from her elemental skill is shorter than Kaya's. These facts do bring up an important question. Why is that the case? We could just say that the programmers at Hoyoverse decided it to be that way, or we could run crazy with an idea. Looking at these facts, I would like to bring up a possibility with some speculation. These seem to suggest that there might be some sort of connection between the two scenarios. We can say that Kaya applies more cryo with his elemental skill than Rosario. Maybe to describe the amount of an element applied to something, we can term it as gauge. Therefore, the reason why Kaya's ice bridge from his elemental skill lasts longer than Rosaria's is because he has a higher gauge. Now notice something. We've managed to come up with a hypothesis explaining why this phenomena happened. Could we potentially use this term of gauge to explain some of the other facts from earlier? Yet another hypothesis to test. Sure enough, Deluxe elemental skill aura doesn't last as long as Bennett's, so it's reasonable to say that Bennett's elemental skill has a higher gauge than Deluxe. This can also explain why Bennett's elemental skill can light grass on fire, but Deluxe can't. If we test this hypothesis of gauge enough times and show that it holds, we can officially say that we've come up with a theory, or in other words, we've developed elemental gauge theory. A theory is a rigorously tested explanation for why facts are what they are. Notice here that unlike a hypothesis which might only need a handful of tests, a theory strictly must be tested heavily. Oftentimes when people say, I have a theory, it actually is a hypothesis for that reason. Also, a hypothesis is more general than a theory because a theory focuses solely on explaining the why behind a fact. What's particularly interesting is that elemental gauge theory was able to unify a bunch of facts under a single concept of gauge. Not all theories can explain a large amount of facts. Sometimes a theory can really only explain one thing. What matters in a theory is that it can explain why and that it's tested heavily. It's also important to consider that a theory isn't set in stone. It can be updated or even replaced by a better theory if it comes along. Heck, sometimes a theory is capable of explaining another theory. Basically, every theory has its limits and determining them is important to making new and more robust theories. I want to put extra emphasis that being verifiable or provable as true or false is an important factor in science in general. If you can't verify your model, then you can't be sure it works in the first place. In empirical science, we want to make sure that our theories can be proven wrong. This is what we call falsifiable. A falsifiable theory is one that is testable, and if you can test it, you can verify it. If your theory is not falsifiable, that means you can't experimentally test it, and therefore becomes pseudoscience. Here's another interesting thing to keep in mind. You can't really prove something is true with 100% certainty. You can only prove it's false. Why is that? Well, let's assume that we have a hypothesis we wish to test. We would have to conduct an experiment infinitely many times to say for certain that it's true or false. 
However, it's clearly obvious that we can't do infinitely many tests. We can only do a finite amount of them. The best you can do from a finite amount of experiments is that you increase the probability that the statement is right, but you can never be 100% sure. This is another reason why theories are prone to change or be replaced. Remember how I mentioned something about patterns near the start of the video? The thing is, if there's a pattern, it means that, given the right circumstances, you should be able to reproduce the same result. For instance, if we mix red and blue colors, it should always come out as purple. That's a pattern that will always happen if you only mix red and blue together. If any other color came out when mixing the two, then we would have to say that it's ultimately unpredictable when mixing red and blue colors together, which is not a very nice thing. When a pattern exists, there should be a way to systematically determine the outcome. For example, we can use a Punnett square to guess what traits a child would have given what genes the parents have. This is a law. In other words, a law is an explanation for how something behaves. Oftentimes, laws can be expressed as equations, but sometimes they can just be general processes like the Punnett square or even statements. Newton's laws of motion are often expressed in words, but they do have an associated equation for each of them. However, the word version of the law gives more insight and understanding. Let's measure the element application duration times for all of the characters because why not? What's interesting is that there are skills and bursts with the same duration. We can take these skills and bursts with the same duration and put them into groups or categories. Recall from earlier that we said that the reason why Rosaria's ice bridge doesn't last as long as Kaya's is because Rosaria has less gauge than Kaya. So I think it would be reasonable to say that element applications of the same duration have an equal amount of gauge. While we're at it, let's quantify the gauges. We'll label them as 1, 2, and 4 based on their duration. One of the most important things about laws is that they can make predictions. So for example, if we know the duration of an element applied to an enemy, we know how much gauge the source had. Two facts we could observe are the following. If you trigger an elemental reaction, the duration of the aura on the enemy will decrease and the gauge is directly related to aura duration. Something we also know is that the decay rate of an aura depends on the gauge of the applicator. Since there are three different decay rates, let's just label the one gauge decay rate with A, the two gauge with B, and the four gauge with C. Let's now try to tackle some basic elemental reactions. There are some things we know based on our established facts, so we can hypothesize the following. One. Gauge is directly proportional to aura duration. 2. Aura gauge decreases over time. 3. The decrease of an aura gauge due to an elemental reaction is proportional to the trigger gauge. And lastly, 4. If the aura gauge of a target is less than or equal to 0, the aura is removed. When we say that y is directly proportional to x, that literally just means that y equals to x multiplied by a constant. This constant is called the proportionality constant. There's also inverse proportionality, which says that y is equal to 1 divided by x, times the proportionality constant. Anyway, we certainly have already confirmed the first two hypotheses. But to determine the proportionality constants, we really just have to do experiments. Also, that last hypothesis is more of a definition because we specifically set it to be zero when there is no aura. At least it makes the most sense that way. So if we do a basic experiment where we apply different gauges onto enemies, we can measure the time it takes for the gauge to fully go to zero and thus the aura disappears. Next on the agenda. <laughs> Come on. 
adventure time. These times are listed in the table as shown. One last thing before we start playing with elemental reactions. How do we know that gauge actually decreases when an elemental reaction is triggered? Well, actually this one is pretty easy to prove. If we trigger an elemental reaction, we can see that the aura duration is much shorter compared to when there is no elemental reaction. And because the aura duration is directly proportional to how much gauge is on the target, we can say for certain that gauge must decrease upon triggering an elemental reaction. Now let's get to that third hypothesis and play around with some elemental reactions. To do that, we need to make more hypotheses. First, applying a 1 gauge electro trigger to a 2 gauge cryo aura results in a 1 gauge cryo aura with a decay rate of B. The notation that I put on the screen is not standard, however I do like how it looks, so I'm going to be using it for the rest of the video. So on the left hand side, we can see that there is 1A gauge of Electro, and the arrow is pointing to the 2B cryo. Notice that the triggering element is on the tail end side of the arrow, and it points towards the aura. You can also see that I have indicated the gauge type as well as the element. For our second hypothesis, we will state that applying a 2 gauge electro trigger to a 2 gauge cryo aura removes the aura. Third, applying a 1 gauge pyro trigger to a 2 gauge cryo aura results in a 1 gauge cryo aura with a decay rate of B. Lastly, applying a 1 gauge cryo trigger to a 2 gauge pyro aura results in a 1 gauge pyro aura with a decay rate of B. To test these hypotheses, I've used the following characters Kaya, Diona, Lisa, Beidou, Bennett, and Yanfei. Notice that for reactions 1, 2, and 4, we're supposedly left with 1 gauge with a decay rate of B. If we multiply the 1 gauge by the decay rate for B, we should see that the aura should remain for 6 seconds. Obviously, the 0 gauge ones just result in 0 seconds. After conducting the experiments... Well... What's the hurry? Cool it! Dick. All but one of them were false, the actual times were the following. Now, let's not feel bad that we got this wrong. Being right is not as important when conducting experiments. The whole point of the experiment is to test. Notice that despite having false hypotheses, we can still learn a lot from the situations. Let's analyze each case. 
For the 2B Electro Trigger applied to the 2B Cryo Aura, we managed to get this one correctly. Recall our third hypothesis from earlier. The decrease in aura gauge is proportional to the trigger gauge. Remember when we state is proportional to, all that really means is that there's a constant being multiplied to the value. Let's call that constant the reaction proportionality constant. So we have a 2B electro trigger going into a 2B cryo aura. This results in a 2 minus 1 times 2B cryo aura. And well, that mathematical expression results in 0, therefore there is no element left on the enemy. Since our hypothesis is correct, we can assume that the reaction proportionality constant when applying electro to cryo must be 1. Let's look at the 1A pyro trigger applied to a 2B cryo aura reaction. Based on the results, it seems to suggest that the 1A pyro application completely removes all the gauge so it could be 0 or negative. This implies that the reaction proportionality constant must be greater than 1. So rather than it being the following reaction, we can consider the reaction proportionality constant multiplied to the trigger gauge. Maybe for a forward reaction, the proportionality constant is 2 since we want the final gauge to be equal to 0. Therefore, the calculation is a 1A pyro trigger applied to a 2B cryo aura is equal to a 2 minus 2 times 1B cryo aura. 2 minus 2 times 1 is 0, so therefore there is no element left. Now let's look at the 1A electro trigger applied to a 2B cryo aura reaction. We clearly see that the decay times are different from the expected value. We already know that the reaction proportionality constant is 1, so what's going on? We know that the reaction proportionality constant is, well, constant, but the decay rate should also be constant. Actually, we can't be sure of that, but programming differential equations would be more effort than it's worth, so we can assume that the decay rate is just a constant. If the decay rate is constant, then that must mean that the values that we have for our decay rates must be wrong. We also need to recall the aura durations from earlier. These must be maintained. As far as we know, there could be multiple things wrong, but we just don't know. It might take a while, but if you think hard about it, we assume that 100% of the gauge from the elemental skill was applied to a target. We actually don't know if that's true. Let's make a new hypothesis. The amount of gauge applied to a target is proportional to the gauge of the source. The proportionality constant we'll be using for this one will be called the application efficiency. We're going to start to get into some math, so be warned. Let the application efficiency be eta, the gauge of the source be g, and the actual gauge applied to the target be g prime. Recall our statement from earlier. The amount of gauge applied to a target refers to g prime, is proportional to refers to eta and the gauge of the source refers to g. So we have g prime is equal to eta times g. We can divide both sides by g and we get that eta is equal to g prime divided by g. Unfortunately, we do not know how to determine g prime at the moment. However, we can use some algebra to calculate the efficiency. Let's say we have an element with gauge g and a decay rate of d star. Note that D star doesn't account for the application efficiency loss. We know that the aura duration T is the following. T equals G times D star. We know that the actual amount of gauge applied to the target is G prime. If we're talking about the same source, the aura duration should not change. Since G prime is less than G, we know that the actual decay rate, which I'll call D, should be higher. So here we see that T is equal to G prime times D, And then, we can substitute for t with g times d star. However, remember that g prime is equal to eta times g, so we can substitute that into g prime. What we're left with is eta times g times d is equal to g times d star. 
we can divide both sides by g and the g's cancel out, leaving us with eta times d, which is equal to d star. And from there we can see that eta is equal to d star divided by d. So far, this is what we have. Eta is equal to g prime divided by g, which is also equal to d star divided by d. Currently, we don't know the actual gauge applied to the target, the actual decay rate, and the application efficiency, so we still can't solve for anything. Let's recall our elemental reaction from earlier. We have an aura consisting of two cryo units with a decay rate of d2, and a trigger with one unit of electro with a decay rate of d1 is applied to that aura. However, there is something wrong with this. The two units of cryo assumes that 100% of the source's gauge is applied to the source, which we know isn't true. In reality, there's a second hidden action taking place. Those two gauge units of cryo are being applied to the target. By definition, the amount of gauge applied to the source is G prime, so the resulting reaction is that Two units of cryo with a decay rate of d2 are applied to a target which equals to g prime. Recall from earlier that g prime is equal to eta times g. Substituting for g prime gives two units of cryo with a decay rate of d2 applied to the target is equal to eta times g. But g is the amount of gauge applied to the source, which is two units of cryo, so two cryo d2 applied to a target is equal to eta 2 cryo d2. Going back to the elemental reaction, one unit of electro with a decay rate of d1 is applied to an aura with two units of cryo with a decay rate of d2 should actually have an aura consisting of eta 2 cryo units. The result is that you have eta 2 minus 1 cryo d2 units. Recall the equation for aura duration. T equals G times D2. This G is the resulting gauge of the elemental reaction, so G equals to eta 2 minus 1 gauge units, and D2 is just equal to D. But remember that eta is equal to D star divided by D. Multiplying both sides by D and dividing both sides by eta, it results in D is equal to D star divided by eta. This means that we can substitute for d, which gives t is equal to eta 2 minus 1 u times d star divided by eta. Wait a minute, we know that d star is equal to 6 seconds per unit, the supposed decay rate, and t is equal to 4.5 seconds, the aura duration. We now have that 4.5 seconds is equal to eta 2 minus 1 u times 6 seconds per unit divided by eta. All of the units in this equation cancel out, and then we can distribute the 6 divided by eta into the parentheses, which gives 4.5 is equal to eta 2 times 6 divided by eta minus 6 divided by eta. The etas in the first term cancel out, and then we can multiply the 2 and 6, resulting in 4.5 is equal to 12 minus 6 divided by eta. We can add 6 divided by eta to both sides and then subtract 4.5 to both sides, which results in 6 divided by eta is equal to 12 minus 4.5. 12 minus 4.5 is equal to 7.5, so 6 divided by eta is equal to 7.5. We can multiply both sides by eta and divide both sides by 7.5, which gives eta is equal to 6 divided by 7.5. Evaluating this finally gives an application efficiency of 0.8 or 80%. This 80% application efficiency is by convention called the aura tax in theory crafting. Recall this table from earlier showing the decay times. We can now fix the values and show the actual decay times using the following equation. D is equal to D star divided by eta. Alright, let's backtrack a bit. We wanted to know why a 1A electro trigger applied to a 2B cryo results in an aura duration of 7.5 seconds. Let's now account for the aura tax and the actual decay rate. So G prime is equal to 0.8 times 2B cryo equals 1.6B cryo. So for the 1A electro trigger applied to a 2B cryo aura, 
This is equal to 0 0.8 times 2 minus 1 times 1 with a decay rate of B cryo. Doing the math, we can see that this results in a 0.6B cryo aura. Next, we can calculate for the aura duration using the actual decay rate and the gauge. So 0.6B multiplied by 7.5 seconds per B gauge is equal to 4.5 seconds. By accounting for the aura tax and using the actual decay rates, we've managed to successfully predict the correct values. Now, we can look at the last scenario, a 1A cryo trigger applied to a 2D pyro aura. What's most likely wrong is that we assume that the reaction proportionality constant was 1, so let's solve it using algebra. We have that 8.25 seconds is equal to 0.8 times 2 minus epsilon times 1 B times 7.5 seconds per B gauge. The gauges cancel out, and we can multiply everything out, and eventually we arrive that epsilon is equal to 0.5, or exactly 1 half. We could do some more hypotheses and try to verify them, but the end result is that we have a set of laws explaining how elemental reactions behave, and we've confirmed our hypothesis while refining the equations and constants. 1. Gauge is directly proportional to aura duration. 2. When applying an element to an enemy, only 80% of the source's gauge is applied. 3. Aura gauge decays at a constant rate depending on the source's gauge. 4. The decrease of an aura gauge due to an elemental reaction is proportional to the trigger gauge. And 5. If the aura gauge of a target is less than or equal to zero, the aura is removed. These five laws are capable of explaining how the melt, vaporize, superconduct, and overload reactions work. I don't actually know if they work for all the other reactions, but I'm at the limit of my knowledge in elemental gauge theory. To avoid any misinformation, I would just recommend that you look up a video. Let's have a recap. A hypothesis is a statement to be tested. A scientific fact is a heavily tested observation. A theory is a heavily tested explanation for why facts are what they are. And lastly, a law is a heavily tested explanation for how things behave. Notice the generality of a hypothesis. If it is tested enough, it can evolve into any of the other three. Though it's important to note that there isn't a hierarchy here. All of these scientific terms are equally valuable. You might have noticed that I actually haven't answered the main question of the video. Well, your patience has finally paid off, as I will finally be answering it. I want to speak to both casual players and hardcore players on this one. The point of theory crafting in Genshin Impact is to understand the game's combat. That's literally it. It really is just that simple. From there, people can get a better idea and deduce what each character is capable of, how to gear them, who to prioritize if they care enough about utility, and so on. The decisions or recommendations given by people as to what you should do as a player are subjective, not objective. Those are statements inferred by interpreting the theory. While they are based on objective facts, the statement is ultimately subjective. Science, while objective, doesn't tell you what to do. It can only explain and predict phenomena. You can use the information science gives you to make decisions, but the science itself doesn't make the decision. You do. You make the decision. The same goes for theory crafting. It makes objective statements, but theory crafters make inferences based on their interpretation of the information the theories tell them. It is ultimately up to you whether or not you choose to follow their advice. Mistakening the advice as objective can cause serious trust problems in scientists, especially if something goes wrong. Sabine Hossenfelder has a video talking about this called Follow the Science? Nonsense, I say. Do note that there is some strong language and it is a rant video, but it does make some really good points. I tend to notice that people can get up in arms over being objective, particularly in theorycrafting types of topics. However, objectivity and subjectivity aren't inherently important. These are the things to consider. 1. The claim itself. 2. The relevance to the conversation. And 3. The evidence, proof, or reasoning to back up the claim.
This is to the casual players. You might ask, why would someone care so much about the combat performance of a character, especially since this is a single player game without PvP? Well, it's because those are the aspects of the game that they enjoy. You can't blame MetaFocus players for liking the combat system of the game, just as much as they can't blame you for finding interest in other things. Then, for the single player no PvP argument, keep in mind, people always find ways to make these kinds of games competitive. Speedrunning is a great example of this. It also just so happens that the only permanent endgame content in the game is, well, timer based. The last thing I want to mention is this. You can't exactly tell them to play a different game for a better combat experience. Imagine this, you really like Genshin's story, but have issues with it. Then someone tells you, if you don't like the story, just go play a different game. Here's the thing, you like Genshin's story. You're only going to get Genshin's story from Genshin Impact, and no other game can do that. This is the same thing for combat. People who mostly enjoy the combat of the game enjoy Genshin's combat. No other game, even Zenless Zone Zero, can provide the same combat experience. While some may be able to provide the same thrill, the systems in place are completely different, unless for some reason a game literally copies the combat system, which would probably face many legal issues unless it's Hoyo themselves who put them out. This is for the meta players. I understand that it can be rather annoying to hear the statements I mentioned in my message to the casual players, but you also can't blame them for getting emotional. You have to remember that these people care about the characters on a deeper level than just being useful. Saying that you can't recommend a character or that they're bad is almost the equivalent of putting a price tag on a person from a casual person's perspective. Putting a price tag might be a bit of an extreme way to put it, but the thing is, you're putting value into them, you're making, you're assigning them a value. And well, again, it's kind of hard not to think of it like a price tag. You might argue that you put disclaimers that what you say is from a meta perspective so it's their fault for continuing and they shouldn't be upset for being told the facts. The thing about disclaimers is this. It's like the statement, no offense, but insert a not so nice sentence. You also can't blame a casual player for continuing to watch the video despite the disclaimer because maybe they want to know if their character is good or bad and why. Another thing to consider is the way you're telling the facts. For one, it could be rather difficult to listen to people who are blunt. Second, rather than using phrases like X is better than Y because X has higher DPS than Y or any similar expression is going to sound more personal than if you just said X has a higher DPS than Y. Basically, don't make it feel personal. Remember what I said earlier about mistaking objective and subjective statements. It is objective to say that one character performs better in certain circumstances over another, but it is not objective to say that the character is bad or that you can't recommend them or whatever way it may be. Notice that I had to outright state that it was from your perspective. You can't recommend them. You recommend them or whatever it is. You think it's bad. You think they're bad or you think they're good. You. It's you. That is exactly for the reason why the statement is subjective. Then for the last one, why should they be upset about being told the facts? Here's the thing, just because a statement is true doesn't mean that you can't feel bad about it. If you were told you failed a test and it was true, well, of course it's not going to be a very pleasant feeling. The truth hurts sometimes. I do hope that this can help both sides understand each other's points of views. I recall some time ago from a livestream Walrus did, he reacted to a video by Flip claiming that because Walrus has a lack of knowledge in the science behind Genshin's combat, you shouldn't take his claims about the character's performance seriously. I internal cooldown on Ayato, but I've come to find that due to his fast Hydro attacks along with his burst skill and his normal slashes being Hydro. It, it just, there's no Pyro character or, or Pyro application for that matter that is fast enough to keep up with it. Okay, thank you, Walrus. Would this take you just to mention that you don't know anything about elemental gauge theory? 
I don't know anything about elemental gauge theory. Clip this, ship it. I also just really don't appreciate when content creators do claim to talk about meta and then hand out team recommendations. Don't even know the basics of how elemental reactions work. Your whole argument for a certain topic falls flat when you don't even know the foundation of the argument. See. While Walrus doesn't understand the theories or laws behind the combat system, the thing is, he can still state facts. Players can constantly make observations about the game. This is something all of us have in common. Walrus and most players make hypotheses and observations. The things Walrus says in his videos about character performances are hypotheses. To put things into perspective, to say that you can't trust Walrus claims about character performance since he doesn't know theory crafting concepts is the same thing as saying, you need to refer to a physicist who understands Einstein's general relativity to know that a ball will fall to the ground. Count Sachs says again, it's like saying you need to know general relativity to say that a ball falls to the ground. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we need to be so try hard. I think leave the theory crafting jobs to the theory crafters. Most of you probably don't even know what this equation means, and an even smaller amount know how to solve it. But you certainly know a ball can fall. That is because we all make observations that if you let go of a ball mid-air, it will drop to the ground. We do the same thing when we're in Genshin. I can see that if I use Bennett's burst and then Xiangling's burst, Xiangling does more damage even if I walk outside Bennett's circle. You can trust Walrus claims, because he can make observations and he can make hypotheses. However, there is another thing, you need to be able to prove your hypothesis. And well, Flip, to be fair, does try to present his counter arguments using the theories and laws, so good on you Flip. However, here's a big problem. So let me be of service and give the most bare bones explanation of why trying to make Aito do forward vaporize will never work. Likewise for things like Melting Top, multiplicative reactions like Melting Vape, you have a forward reaction, which is where you increase your damage by two times, so Hydro onto Pyro or Pyro onto Cryo. And then you have reverse reactions, where it's the opposite and it gives you a 1.5 times multiplier to your damage. Also, every elemental attack in this game that only applies an element, but a unit of that element, which is essentially how strong the element is on an enemy. Normal and charge attack infusions as well as elemental skills and bursts that attack multiple times will usually apply one unit, whereas attacks that are big hits like Child's Burst or other like one-off skills and bursts, they apply two units of an element. If you do a reverse vaporized reaction with one unit... I'm lost. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm lost. Unit of Hydro and one unit of Pyro. The one unit of Pyro will only take uh, essentially half of the Hydro unit away, meaning you can apply another unit of Pyro after that as well. So the Hydro Aura will essentially be on the enemy for longer, so you can chain reverse reactions. The problem is that forward reactions are not designed to be chained. If you apply one unit of Pyro and then one unit of Pyro, the Pyro unit will just eat the Cryo unit, and even if you have an ability that applies two units of Cryo, that one Pyro unit will just eat both of the Cryo units. Theoretically, if you get Jinxiao and turn him into a Cryo, we'll call him Jing, Jing Yu, he wouldn't be able to enable forward multiple Pyro characters like Vital, because these reactions are quite literally not designed to be chained intentionally, and then you have to take into account ICDs, and you just realize how. Yeah, so. Essentially, then melt melt reaction is meant to be one big hit. Am I am I am I correct to assume that? When Walrus reacted to the video, he wasn't able to understand the concepts when it was being presented. This is a major red flag. Imagine the very person you were criticizing failed to understand your own critique of him. This segues into the next part of my video, the topic of science communication. If no one can understand your theory of everything, it's useless, no matter how right it is. This is also why pseudoscience and conspiracy theories tend to gain traction. Sometimes science can be so complex that people outside the field can find it difficult to believe. Understanding what science says versus what a scientist is saying is also a part of science communication. Not clearly differentiating these can lead to mistrust of science, as I've mentioned before. Theory crafters. I find that there are a lack of videos actually explaining theory crafting concepts. I get that the Ketching Mains library exists, but last time I checked, not a lot of people like to read what is essentially a lecture. There are some nice videos on elemental gauge theory, like from Zajef77, then Sevi Place also has some nice videos on theory crafting in general. Though, other than that, I can't find anything explaining other aspects. Throughout my time looking into theory crafting, I couldn't find any videos explaining how to make predictions using the theories and laws. At most, I found a video just showing the predictions, but not how those predictions even arrived in the first place. Oftentimes in videos about whether or not you should pull someone, especially pre-release, 
They mentioned the performance of the character, but how did they get those results? What assumptions were made? And where could the interpretation be wrong? That last one is especially important. If we don't understand the process leading up to the results, how can players trust you? That is something about science. We need to be able to reproduce results. Granted, not all players want that level of detail, but it's still important. In actual studies and research, we have to state how we're doing our experiments step by step in detail, what the significance of our study is, the materials used, what are the assumptions, review of other literature, how many times you need to do the experiment, how the theories and laws play into the study, what the actual results are, how we got the results, what statistical analyses were used, what happened during the experimentation, why the results are what they are, how to improve the experiment, what still needs clarification, and other recommendations for future study. So far, the only things I see being communicated generally are the results and not everything else. I commend I Win to Lose Gaming for actually being someone who is doing, for the most part, proper science communication. I especially commend him for actually showing his experiments as well as possible inaccuracies, discrepancies, or errors while also explaining why certain results came out the way they did. Whether or not you agree with his results, you do have to keep in mind he's doing an experiment and testing. On a side note, you'd actually have to explain why he got his results. If you can't, your theories and laws are actually at risk of being wrong. Do note that you can criticize his methods like gear choice, the experiment setup itself, the method of evaluation, etc. Just be sure to propose alternative ways to conduct the experiment. This is what is known as peer review. Did I disguise this video with Genshin Impact and theory crafting to have a reason to talk about science? Yeah. Did I also try to make the title of this video sound like I was hating on theory crafting? Yes, I admit it. But hey, I hope you all found this video interesting and that some people also may have a new found respect for theory crafters because of this video. I actually wanted to become a theory crafter, but as I've mentioned, I find the lack of resources rather alarming, so get working on that, please. Anyway, in conclusion, theory crafting, while it can be seen as quite excessive, isn't useless. The purpose of theory crafting is to understand Genshin Impact's combat system. It's a science. The theories and laws developed from it can then be used to explain phenomena in-game and make predictions. These can then be used to make recommendations and help players make decisions on how to utilize their characters. So yeah. That's really about it for now, so thanks for watching and hope you've enjoyed.